The, um, tonight I want to proclaim the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. That's our God. This is, the, this is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is the one that has established and revealed his intended purpose in the earth. This is the God that I want to I examine tonight. Zoom in, as it were, and consider a specific act. act, act. I just get too excited sometimes I can't even talk. A different aspect of his mercy. See, God's merciful. You don't have to, it, to, to ask God to be merciful. He is merciful. Amen. Just like he's love, just like he's, he's a God of truth and a God of judgment. He's, he's merciful. That's what he is. He, he's merciful. But there's another aspect to, to God that's mingled with his mercy, is God is eternal. Now see, there's a foundation on which God works. He does all things according to the counsel of his own will. This is our God. He's, a, he's not mercy, in other words, when, when, when we're in, our, in the scripture we're going to look at tonight, when it's tied to that, you get the picture that mercy is not reactionary. It's because of who he is. God is eternal. So you would expect since God is eternal, that every aspect of his nature is eternal. See, God's love is eternal. It's him. It's who he is. So it's not like God just showing something that's, that's transitory. Not at all. God's revealing the merciful God because he's from everlasting to everlasting. His mercy endures forever. See, so see, this isn't something that, that you can, this isn't something that, that's going to, you're going to wind up at the judgment and say, oh, his mercy ended. No, it's not. Actually, when you can see it right, his mercy is intended for that time. You'll be able to pass through that time and you'll be able to say, oh, the Lord is merciful. His mercy endured. It, it, it brought me all the way through. The same mercy that saved me brought me to this blessed shore that I stand upon now. See, that Hope projects us to the time when God's mercy actually is realized. Now, see, it's, we're, we're, we're hoping for the mercy. We're hoping for the grace that will be brought into us when it has appearing. We're hoping. We're tasting of it, just like those big old grapes of Eskol. See, they got them. We're tasting of his mercy, but it's just the first fruits. Believe me on that day, when you stand before him on that day, and you're delivered from the wrath to come, you'll say, great is thy mercy, now, king of kings. So there's never going to come a time... There never has been a time, and there never will be a time when God will stop being merciful. It's a part of who he is. Now, okay, now, there's many different aspects of God. God's holy, right? There's never going to come a time when God's going to stop being holy. He's holy. In fact, you know, and from heaven's point of view, he's holy, holy, holy. He's, he's far lifted up above every other personality. He's holy. You're never going to come a time when God's going to stop being that. It's who he is. And uh, God's just. Now, this justice, this justice of God, it's never going to come a time when he's, he's, his justice won't work because of his mercy. These, God's not at war with himself. So if God's going to be merciful to you, it has to also be just and right. It has to be. Otherwise, God's not going to be merciful to you. That's why he said that we'll by no means acquit the guilty. Because God's, God's going to do everything right. He's righteous. He's also good. Let's talk a little bit about that. The goodness of the Lord. He's good. That's what he is. He's good. He's never going to stop being good. In other words, if God had to stop being good to save you, he's not going to save you. This is just the way God is. He's not going to, see, he's not at war with himself. Sometimes men, the way they talk, it almost makes God seem like he's at war with himself. Amen. In other words, in order for him to have love on you, he'd have to stop being just. I mean, this, is, this isn't going to happen. That's right. 
God sent Christ into the world to take sin away, which foundationally was the only problem the human race had. They were sinners. They sinned. Their nature was to sin. God sent someone in to take away sin that he might be just and the justifier of all them that believe on him. So see, this is God's part of who he is, is what I'm, what, what I'm um, talking about here. Now, the, 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 God has to be this way. It has to be that you can have confidence in God to not change. He's got to stay the same because otherwise, um, how, how are you, what kind of confidence are you going to have for a future time, a time that's yeah. out of your hands? See, now it, men suffer with the delusion that they're in control. But believe me, after they're dead, they're going to know. They're not the ones that are in control right. at all. They're not the ones. God will never stop being what he is. Um, and that actually is a great commentary on, on God. He's never going to stop being God. And I, I, I love that, just that thought. In other words, you can't, you, you're never going to be able to appeal to God's love. See, I, I hear a lot of appeals to God's love. He's, he's, he loves everyone. He appeals to his love. And yet they forget that he's just and he's holy and he's righteous. They, they, they forget all this stuff. So now you can't take him. Bring a sinner to God. I'm sorry, you can't do that. God's just. He's holy. His, his wrath can be kindled. You're going to have to bring a sinner to Jesus, and he's going to have to take his sin away. He's going to clean him up. You've got to start working in him, yeah. both the will and do of his good pleasure, and then he'll bring them to God. Yeah. See, that's, a, that's what it will do. Yeah. Why God set it up like this? Because God knows who he is. God knows what he's like. So, you know, you, there, there's a certain manner of the kingdom, and this is the way God set it up, because this is the only way you could exist or live past the experience of meeting God, because God's holy. He's just. He will by no means clear the guilty. He won't do it. And isn't it a great thing that he, he told us that? He actually told us. Yes. I won't clear the guilty. Now, you're going to have to get out of the category of guilty, right? If you're going to stay with God, you've got to get out of that. And, and praise God, he's given us a Savior that can do just that work. Amen. He can make us not guilty. Ah, people say, well, you're just too proud. They say, no, you just don't know Christ. He can make you not guilty. Amen. He can make it to where you can stand before God boldly, confidently, Amen. knowing that my sins have been taken away. They're gone. The, etern the eternality of God is reflected in everything that he does, everything that he purposes, everything that he promises is attached to the fact that he's eternal. Amen. See, in, order, in other words, in order for him to work, his promise, he has to be eternal. He can't, you can't just, you can't do what God's doing in a single lifetime. You can't, no, okay, how about a single generation? No, you can't do what God's doing. In order to do what God's doing, you got to be eternal. Amen. You got to be able to carry out the things that you've purposed. <clears throat> everything that he promised, everything that he purposed is tied to who he is. It's, it's an actual Actually, it's something that came from God and is to God, is everlasting. See, it's mercy, it's from everlasting, from, from God, to everlasting. It's actually to and for God. Everything that God's done is, um, is well, this is, this, is, this is wonderful because see, human, the human race isn't an accident. Some God purposed, before time ever was, before he purposed and something that he matured or brought to pass and then something he's going to receive back to himself. This is something that God did. God purposed it. <clears throat> now tonight <clears throat> for a few minutes I want to, to think about this. Um, his mercy. His mercy. Psalms 103.17. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. I want to back up a little bit. I want to give some context to this. Verse 13. <clears throat> Verse 13 of that chapter. <clears throat> <clears throat> Psalms 103 says, Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth everyone, them that fear him. That's who he pities. That's who the Lord pities. Like a father pitieth his children. See, he gives us something we can understand. He gives us something that we can actually look at and now we can understand this is the way God is. See, now why does a, a, a man pity at his children? Because he wants to reflect this image of a God. 
He wants us to understand that. So he makes man to have pity for his children. You notice how um, you can pity your children a lot quicker than you can pity somebody else's children. It's just the truth. Why God make it that way? So you can understand that he pities them that fear him. But now, if that's true, I want to fear God. Because he pities them that fear him. See, I want to honor God for who he is. Why? Because he pities them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. He knows our frame. He knows he doesn't need anybody to testify about man. He made man. He knows what's inside of us. In other words, God doesn't ever put on us more than we can bear. He never does that. Why? Because he pities us. He knows our frame. He knows we're just but dust. He doesn't expect more of us than we can do. And yet some people say he does. Some people imply that he has. But he hasn't. Not at all. If God asked you to do it or told you or commanded you to do it, you can do it by his grace. He knoweth our frame. Sometimes I need to know my frame. I need to become more acquainted with my frame. Because a man, you know, man's by nature filled with pride. He thinks he can do more than he can do. He thinks he can work out his own righteousness. No, no. Teach us to number our days. He, know, he remembers that we're but dust. As for man, I just talk about a man. What kind of capacities do you have, man? As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. It appears for a moment that he has all this glory. Just, just wait. Just wait for a few minutes here. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. It's like you never even existed. Yeah. It's, like the, it's like it never was even there. Yeah. And yet it boasted a lot for a few moments. The flesh, flesh has this capacity to boast, but you get in the context of God. You get in the context of eternity. That's what he's setting the stage here. He's showing us, he's making this contrast about man, which is just, just like, just for a moment. He appears for a moment and is gone. All right? But, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. There's never a time when the Lord's never been merciful. He is merciful. Amen. But see, his mercy needed an expression. It needed, it needed to be expressed. You know, it's, what good is a God to, that's merciful if he's never merciful? If there's never a, an occasion for him to be merciful. Amen. So what did he do? He made man in his own image. In his own image. Why? So he could be touched so he could be compassionate, so he could pity them. Why? Because they're made in his own image, after his own likeness. This is our God. He knows exactly what's it going to take for God to be pitiful. Well, you need a creature that's made in his own image, that's fallen. One that's made in his image that needs compassion. Yeah. What does God do? He pities them. And he, he exercises his compassion. He opens it up and shows principalities and powers in heavenly places that don't need one bit of mercy. They don't need any mercy. They've never fallen. They've never transgressed. They do what he wants instantly. Right. Instantly. That's right. the, the, the living creatures that are around the throne, they've never said, they've never rebelled. They've never had any thought whatsoever of violating the perfect will of God. But these ones that were made in his image they needed mercy why because God setting the stage he's opening up this is who he is he's merciful everlasting to everlasting upon who who is he everlasting who does he express his mercy to well you say well the Lord pitieth everyone this, I've heard this he pities everyone the same he loves everyone the same just to, that isn't what it says here. That isn't even what it implies here. What does it imply? Everyone? Well, if you can say everyone's his children, so I guess there's a sense in which it's everyone that's born in the image of God, but he's more precise here, isn't he? He's more precise here than just saying everyone that was ever born. That isn't what he said. He says, 
among them. His children now. to talk about his children. He gets more specific when he says them. Talk about his children. Them that fear him. So the children, those that are made in his image, that fear him, he pities them. Amen. Thank you. That's who he pities. He pities them, right. the ones that fear him. Mm. Why? Because you, nobody fears him by accident. Nobody fears him on their own. Yeah. God's been working in these. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> God's mercy extends beyond what we do. Now, understand what I'm saying here. It isn't like what we do is independent of his mercy. See, what we do actually is an extension of his mercy. Yes. That's what it is. It's an extension. God worked in you before you knew he was working in you. Yes, Why? Both to will and to do. Make, to, to bring you, to conform you. In other words, the way I was before wasn't acceptable. The way I was before would have never resulted in God's mercy. In other words, there isn't anything in me that provoked God to be merciful to me all by itself. It wasn't like God looked down and said, oh, that poor brother Bob. You, you see what I'm saying? There? That God worked in me so that he could show something about himself. Amen. So salvation has more to do with God than it does to do with me. I'm a part of it. I'm a, I'm a participant in it. But it's only by His mercy Amen. that I can say that. God's mercy extends beyond what we do to the core of our real problem. See, technically, it's Adam's problem that I'm dealing with. I was born with this nature. I was born with this nature that I technically had nothing to do with where it came from. Why did He do it that way? Because he's going to save me through another man who I didn't technically have anything to do with, his obedience. Yeah. This is God's mercy now. This is God, how he worked it out. See, it takes all the glory away from me, doesn't it? And it places it all on him that he's made, it, made a way that he can be just and a justifier and all both of these, the salvation and the sinful nature, actually are independent from me. And yet they're very much a part of me. Well, mm -hmm. hope I didn't lose you there. See, that, that, I want to say it in such a way that it's understandable, but at the same time, these are high things. Yes, these are high things. Huh? God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. He knows. He knows or in other words, he considers our frame that we're but dust. He, he considers it. In other words, he doesn't ask you to save yourself. Now, he did manufacture the law. Or he gave us the law. Why? So that we would know that we needed him. So that we would know and be sure that we can't save ourselves. Well, why did he do that? He remembers that we're but dust. See, he knew, he knows what is in man. He knows what the flesh is going to think. God takes these things into consideration. He knows, he considers our frame. He knows we're but dust. He takes these things into consideration when he works in and upon man. He, he considers their frame. In other words, no man's ever going to be able to point the finger at God and say, you didn't, if you'd have just done this, or if you'd have just done that, I'd have got it. No, he considers our frame. He knows who you are. He knows your limitations. And he knows, he knows even more precisely what's in you. And so, see, he, I can tell you right now, he knew exactly who to send my way. He knew exactly what words that they were going to say to me to get my attention. Whoa, I'm going the wrong way. What's going on? What, what happened? God made a way. See, God knew what was in me. He knew my frame. If he hadn't have worked like this, well, we wouldn't be here right now. Okay, if you just want to go back, back as far as Mount Sinai, they'd all been consumed right then. Uh -oh. We already talked about this today. As soon as God's foot hit that ground, boom, man would have just evaporated. Why? Because God's holy. So God had to restrain himself. He had to hold back because yeah. he remembered our frame. Will the Lord ever forget to be merciful? No, he won't. Why? Because that's who he is. God, God's not going to forget. You don't forget to be who you are. It's who you are. Uh -huh. See, sometimes 
if people talk long enough, you'll find out who they are. <clears throat> because you can't really hold it back. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can't really keep it quiet who you really are. So, you know, as the brethren speak, I, I think, boy, these, I didn't know that this brother was so merciful. I didn't know it, but, oh, as I listened to him speak, I found out. He's a merciful brother. All the while, God's mercy, as he's working with men, he knows their frame. All the while, God's mercy is looking for a way to bless them. This is the stance. It's not like God's looking for a way to condemn you. That would be no work at all. I mean, God doesn't have to look for a reason to condemn you. It's there all the time. He, your frame, just your frame is a reason to condemn you. You can't do it. So if God wanted to be legalistic, as it were, well, you got a reason right there. But that isn't what God's doing. God isn't looking for a reason to destroy man. He's looking for a reason to bless him. An occasion. Is there some occasion that, that can be worked in, in, in these to where God will, I'm going to, look, I'm going to display my mercy here. God sets the stage, and before long, a person will just give themselves to the Lord and follow after him. He'll be a token of mercy. God will be able to hold him up. Say, look at, look at my servant, Job. God's looking for a way to bless his children. God's holiness and God's righteousness demands that it must be done in such a certain way. But nonetheless, mercy found a way. Yeah. Mercy found a way to express itself. Even in the midst of a sinful, fallen creation. Mercy found a way. Okay? Technically, if you want to go back far enough, mercy found a way before he made the man. That's right. So... It should not surprise us because of the way that mercy is expressed in God's nature and love and justice and righteousness. It shouldn't surprise us then that as we go through the gospel, as we see the expression of, the, of, of, of salvation in the scriptures, that we're going to find conditions. This is, shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, God's holy. So he's, he's not going to violate that holiness when he saves men. So you have a condition. And actually, the conditions are, are good for us. How would you know you were in if there wasn't a condition? How would you have any idea that you had obeyed the Lord if there wasn't a condition attached to it? Amen. So it shouldn't surprise us. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Now Mary, the mother of Jesus, the, the night that the angel came to her, she said something. That's, she said a lot of profound things. We're going to just pluck one of them out. This is what she said. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Yeah. All right, now, God's mercy is upon, upon me, technically not because of what I did, but because of what somebody else did. His mercy is from generation to generation. Now, there's a couple different ways of looking at that. Jesus came... All right, now he's the greatest example of God being merciful to the whole world because of one man. All right, but he's done this before. You go back, you find that Abraham, God made a covenant with Abraham that later on, his descendants are going to get in on this mercy because of his, because of his faith. Because of what God told Abraham, his mercy from everlasting to everlasting. See, this is the way God is. If God, now, 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 we already talked about, he won't impute, he won't, he, he, the, the guilty. He's not, he, he's going to deal with these guilty ones. All right, but yet, if it's God's wrath or his displeasure with the fathers can be visited upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation, then it should not surprise us that his mercy will operate the same way. All right, now if God will hold it against you because of something your father did, well, then it works the same way. He's going to be merciful to you because of something your father did. I mean, it, it shouldn't surprise us. Yeah. Why God do it this way? Because, see, that the promise might be sure to the whole seed. That's why God did it this way. It should not surprise us that his mercy, his mercy is more abundant and copious than his wrath. See, you see, otherwise it wouldn't be mercy, right? 
<laughs> the contrast is there. God's wrath isn't shut down by his mercy. It's satisfied. <laughs> his mercy is on them. It's on them that fear him from generation to generation. Or as spoken in our text, same thing from everlasting to everlasting. Now one, one perspective is, is more from man's perspective from generation to generation. But see, that's more, that's more accenting what, what God's covenant with Abraham, see, and to his descendants, generation to generation. But see, in our text, from everlasting to everlasting is accenting the real root of why he's doing it. Because there was a time in the eternity past that there was no men when God made a covenant as it were with himself. He, his eternal purpose was worked out before anything was. So it couldn't have been that God was merciful or moved to mercy just based on what a man did or how a man responded. That's right. It was in God's, it was in his own person. See, God desired he, to, to be merciful. And so his mercy is from everlasting. It was something that he, he, inst uh, he purposed way before see, that he ever implemented that plan. And, and in the end now, remember, Jesus is going to deliver the kingdom back up to the Father, and he himself is going to be subject to him, as he, God is going to be realized as the one who initiated it, the one that brought it to pass, the one that sent Christ, see, the one that, that cursed Christ, as it were, laid sin on him, the one that received him back, and then the one that received all the fruit from the work. Amen. God's, he, these two big pillars, they're God. It's from God and to God. And that mercy is the same way. It's mercy. There came a time when God remembered the descendants of Abraham. Why did God do that? Why, did God, why was God merciful to the descendants of Abraham when, well, it, it, you, can only, you can only cite the scripture. I mean, you say, well, wh why do it? Because this is the way God is. God made a covenant with Abraham. Now, God's not going to violate that covenant that he made with Abraham. Even though hundreds of years later is when its mercy is actually realized. Nonetheless, it was, just a, it, it was just as though Abraham was standing before him. Because Abraham was standing before him. But <laughs> Exodus 2.23, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage, and God heard their groaning. And God said, I have so much pity for them. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham. Yeah. What it says. That here, they're down there. This is very real to them. They're, they're suffering under this bondage. What does God do? He hears their cry. And he remembers his covenant with Abraham. Yeah, I, I especially like this because, you know, when you cry unto the Lord, you know what he's, who, who he remembers then. He remembers his covenant with his son. He remembers his covenant. Oh, yes, they shall all know me, every one of them, from the least to the greatest. I'll be in them. I'll be in them. See, he, this is what God's done to his son. He's made a way that he can be merciful to you and his justice will allow it. God heard their groaning. You've been groaning? You know, we, we um, uh, the, the, the groaning of the saints, this is very precious in the eyes of the Lord. See, we're groaning. You know, why, why, why would we be groaning? Well, remember, their, their bondage. It was their bondage. Well, you've got a body, believe me, that caused you to groan. You groan within yourself. Why? Because you're, you're, you're earnestly hoping or expecting to be clothed upon with your body that's your, your, your new body. But see, that whole process, God hasn't ignored that whole process. The very fact that he has left you here to be conformed into the image of his son. He knows this is going to be painful. He knows your frame. He, he knows what you're going through. And as you groan, see, he's, he hears you. He hears you and he'll give you mercy. He'll be merciful to you. And he'll be gracious to you. Why? Because... Of his covenant with, with Jesus. I like that. Later, Pharaoh would be drowned in the Red Sea. 
if you remember that. Now, see, God used Pharaoh to bring about the groaning. You, you, know, you know that he did that. He used Pharaoh, hardened his heart. Pharaoh was hard on him. They groaned. They, they cried unto the Lord. The Lord delivered them because of his covenant to Abraham. And then God destroyed Pharaoh in the Red Sea, washed their bodies up. Now here, these are the ones. These are the ones who were the participants of the mercy. They got the mercy that was promised to Abraham is what they said. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Here are the bodies. Now get the picture. They're washing up on the shore. All right. These are the ones that, that were just pursuing them. The ones that were running after them. We're going to kill them. We're going to pursue them. We're going to overtake them. And we're going to destroy them. Well, God killed them. They didn't get to, they didn't get to satisfy their lust. Here they are, they're dead on the shores. Who is a God like unto thee, O Lord? Among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Thou stretches out thy right hand, and the earth swallowed them. We saw it. We can testify. We were standing here, and here they coming after us. And all at once the water come down, and it's like God just swallowed them up. Well, our enemies are going to be destroyed like this someday. It stretches out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou, now this is, you, this is the appropriate time to talk about mercy, right? Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. You saved us. You destroyed them. And that was your mercy. Now, how many people do you know that have that, that two-pronged view of mercy? The destruction of the wicked and the salvation of the saints. That's God's mercy. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He hasn't changed one bit. Before he ever made the world, he determined to save them that believe and to destroy them that don't. That's what he's going to do. And it's mercy. It's outpouring pouring of his mercy. They were given to see that the Lord was merciful because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. So it's mercy from generation to generation. Now you go through the old scriptures, and it's just, it's, it's just plentiful with this expression, the mercy of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. It's everlasting, everlasting. It's mercy of the Lord. It endures forevermore over and over and over. Why? Because they, they, it, they became a part of them. They were recipients of his mercy. It changed them. Mercy will do that to you. You know, the, the, the person I want to hear talk about mercy is a person that has tasted that the Lord is gracious. Because when you taste that the Lord is gracious, now you got something to say. I want to hear it. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? See, we can all testify. Anyone who's tasted that the Lord is gracious will tell you there is not any other God like our God. Amen. He can forgive sins, but he by no means will acquit the guilty. His mercy, this one that's from everlasting, which means before anything was created, mercy, all right? Or unto everlasting, even after the earth is destroyed, merciful, all right? God's mercy transcends time. It transcends humanity. It's Him. It's God, and He is merciful. I want to make a point here that even though God's mercy is from generation to generation, nobody on the face of the earth would have ever known that had God not told us. They would have never, you never figured that out on your own. Even just by, by, by observing things, you'd never figure this out. From man's fallen perspective or condition, they cannot naturally grasp or understand anything concerning the nature of the person of God. Unless God reveals himself, men will remain ignorant of who God is. He's higher than the heavens, and his ways are past finding out. And both of those are terms found in the scriptures. This is what he is. Now, remember Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And you can't do that any other place than in Christ. It can't be done. So as you're in Christ, see, you look back and you, see, you understand. You start seeing what he did in, 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 with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and with the prophets, and you start seeing God's merciful. Look at what he did. He's merciful. Man is not naturally eternal. There's not any man that's ever been born from the descendants of Adam 
that's ever partaken of a natural e eternality. They didn't like have an existence that kept going on and on and on. Ah, uh -uh, sorry. Even Methuselah would tell you, thank goodness it finally ended. I finally died. I, can, I, can you imagine if Adam would have taken and eaten of the tree of life in the condition that he was in and lived forever in a sinful condition in the flesh? Oh, see, God prevented that, remember? God prevented that. Why? Because, see, this, this, in that condition, well, his mercy, this would have complicated things greatly. But my, man, by nature, now I'm talking by nature. I know that in Christ, you get into Christ and you can say things like, I'll never die. Mm -hmm. But see, man can't say that on his own. Man is, it's appointed on the man once to die. And after this, to judgment. So, I mean, you can't escape this. It's inevitable. Man is going to die. Flesh is going to go back to the dust from whence he was taken. Yeah, you, you, you think about this. God put him in a world that he created, man. And even, even that testimony, the testimony that as a word screaming out, there's a God, look, there's a God. And they don't get the point. No, they, no man got it. They, they didn't get it. But it's a, still a testimony. It's there. Amen. It says, for the invisible things of, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Well, who clearly seen it? Who got the who got it? I'm talking about a natural man now, just walking around the earth. What they do? They cut down a tree and made a little wooden thing and they bowed down and worshiped it. They they gave the stars names so they could worship them. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, every man that's made in the image of God should be able to look up at the, at the sky and say, there's a God that made this. That's the testimony that God put in it. But they didn't, and he says, they are without excuse. Yeah. That's what he said. God put the testimony there. The fact that, that men don't see it is a testimony of how obtuse the fallen man has become. Man, by nature, cannot find God. God must, God must, if he's going to be merciful now, God must intercede into the affairs of men if they're ever going to realize or taste of this merciful God. Technically, nobody that looks into the heaven should come away with a testimony of unbelief. They shouldn't. But the fact that they do emphasizes the fact that God's going to have to save them. Of course, this, this is God's desire. God's desire is to be merciful. All right? Nobody will ever stand at the judgment and point a finger at the merciful God and say, you didn't do enough to save me. It's not going to happen. God's done an abundant. He's provided an abundant salvation. He's put, he sent preachers out. What do, they, what do they do? They proclaim what God's done, his wonderful works. Now, even in the starlight age, you think, well, we've come a long way. Well, listen to Job. This is what Job said, Job 9, verse 10. Which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wondrous without number. Now, if anyone's ever going to know and understand God's mercy, he must be the one to reveal it. He must be the one to, to open it up to their understanding. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they'll be like Hagar and be standing on top of a well and not even know it. Even then, even, even if God's going to be the one to initiate it, this isn't something that's going to just be done in a moment. You look at the history, the history of, of what God's done, and it didn't happen in just a moment. Why? Because it couldn't be done in just a moment like that. Man had fallen too far for him just to say a word, and they just instantly come alive. Right. A lot of groundwork had to be laid. God laid extensive groundwork in the, in the law and the prophets so that man would be able to come to the knowledge of the truth that he's merciful. Now remember, man's not the only one he's demonstrating this to. The, the objects or the vessels of mercy, technically, they're not the object of what he's doing. The, there, he's, he's using them to show to principalities and powers in heavenly places, his the aspects that they could have never seen. Now, we can see it. 
God gives you to see it. God works in you. you can, you've tasted that the Lord's good. You've tasted of his grace. And so, see, you, you're like an inside participant into the mercy of God. You, you've experienced God's mercy. Now, how valuable will you be in the ages to come to God now as a testimony of his mercy? See, I, I look forward to this, this sitting down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. I know everyone that's in the kingdom, it's tasted of the mercy of the Lord and His grace. You want to sit down. You want to rehearse some of these things. Hey, tell me, Abraham. Tell me on the way over there to, to, to the mount to offer your son. You know, you, you, why do why you want to do that? Because, see, you've, you've tasted of the same thing that he did. It's in a different measure. Even then. God's the one that had to lay the groundwork. He didn't ask a man to lay it. He did because he's eternal. Because the groundwork that needed to be laid extended through many generations. So see, who, who was sufficient for such things? Who could, who could God give an eternal purpose to like this and it be accomplished other than himself? He is eternal. So he's had it all planned out. See, I couldn't even come up with the plan, much less implement it. I could, my mind isn't big enough to even come up with the plan. But he did. He purposed it. He implemented it all the way through. Jesus said, remember one day God spoke to Jesus out of heaven. And um, this is what, not everyone got the message, remember? Yeah. All right. He says, Father, glorify thy name. And there came a voice out of heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said, it thundered. <laughs> and others, an angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now, that's the same things happening today. There's a message that God's putting out, but not everyone's getting it. Some people think, that doesn't sound right. It sounds like it thundered. It, that doesn't, they didn't get any benefit from it at all. And yet Jesus said, it was for you. It, this, this message didn't come for me. It came for you. So they should have got it. They should have got it. Men, although made in the image of God, do not have the power within themselves to make themselves understand. They don't have the power. They can sit inside of a church, hear gospel preaching for 30 years, and still not have the understanding. See, it says, if any, man, if any man have not knowledge, right, want, want wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, right? But what if they never ask? What if they never come? What if they never seek? Well, God will be justified in the day because he's the one that sent the preachers. He's the one that this message has gone out into the whole world. Amen. So see, God's, God's provided the salvation. But see... At best, men cannot affect more than a few generations. At best. You know, now, I can write a will. I can, I can plan this whole thing out. I'm going I'm to affect the next generation. I'm going to write a will, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enforce a bunch of things. You know, I, I'm a man of substance, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this go the way I want it to go. And you, five minutes after you're dead, if the administrator of that will says, don't think so. you got no power to change it. No power whatsoever. But see, God does because he's eternal. So see, his plan, he'll, he'll make people do things. He'll make people think things. He'll make people purpose things that they would have never thought to do. And yet God did it. God does it because he's from everlasting to everlasting. Now, I say that. Because the bottom line is that unless God told us that his mercy endured forevermore, we wouldn't have the kind of confidence that you can have in Christ Jesus. Unless God revealed that it's his desire to be merciful. See, when people needed mercy the most, they may not come. But see, God opened this up. God divulged this to man because he really is merciful. He really does want to be merciful. So... The, man, the natural mind does not have the capacity to rightly consider the term from everlasting to everlasting. I say that because, see, if, 
The man said, well, I can, I can figure this out. I mean, I can look up the word up. But you know, the, the word everlasting, it's interesting because men have tied a lot of things to everlasting that aren't everlasting. I mean, I looked up and they even say some batteries are everlasting. I'm sorry, they don't know what everlasting means. There's nothing in this transitory realm that would even suggest such a thing as everlasting. There's nothing in this world that is going to last forever. Nothing. Amen. It's not. So how, see, in other words, if you believe this, if you believe that, that the mercy of the Lord is everlasting, then God's done a work in you. Because this is something that you're going to have to receive by faith. God is everlasting. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. And if you know that because of the work he's done in you, well, then you're blessed of God. In order for man to be empowered to properly manage these thoughts, God will have to give him, or man, a new mind. Now consider that. He has to give you the mind of Christ in order for you to properly navigate through the thoughts of God. Otherwise, you're never, you're never going to be able to understand what God's talking about in his eternal purpose. You, you, it'll, it'll like boggle your mind. You'll be like, how can these things be so? Well, because God said them. That's, that's why. God said them. That's enough. He'll have, to, he'll have to give you a spiritual mind because God is a spirit, right? And he's speaking, he's speaking those that those, those will walk in the spirit to be able to divulge his secrets to. Yeah. You walk in the spirit and um, God will show you some of his secrets. He'll show you some of, some of the things that he's hid from other people. It's just the truth. God is higher than the heavens. Now from whatever perspective he looks, speaking as, uh, from God's perspective now, wherever he looks, if he looks in the past, if he looks in the present, or if he looks in the future, his intention is to be merciful because his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. So the, God, God, the work of God is, is motivated by who he is. Well, that's, that's good. His mercy is from everlasting because it's a part of who he is. Now, no matter how abundantly he pours it out on the sons of men, no matter how copious the mercy is at this present time, He's never going to run out of mercy. Never going to bottom out with the mercy of the Lord. He's, he's abundant in mercy. Now, if one were to be able to see into eternity and have the mind of Christ from the very beginning, before he ever made anything, you would come to the conclusion, God is rich in mercy. He's a merciful God. But see, no one had that at that point. Not that we have the revelation of, okay? There was no man there. So God worked it out. How will God ensure? I think I've already covered this. Well, I'll just briefly touch on it. But how will God ensure that his abundant, everlasting mercy be fully exercised and revealed to the heavenly personalities? Because you remember, God's, this is what he's doing. The church is a schoolhouse for, for personalities and powers in heaven. So how will God ensure that they get it? And, and it, he'll make someone in his image, like him. Now, see, this, you're going to take dust and make someone that's like you in your image? Only God could do this, and only God could purpose this, and only God did it. God did it in order that he might show things about himself in them that others could witness and couldn't see any other way. In other words... Now, when they cry out, he'll be moved to do good to them. Mm -hmm. it, it, nobody will have to tell him. He'll be moved to do it. So now, there's a sense in which God would have to make an eternal investment in salvation. God knew this before he ever made man. There was going to come a time when he was going to have to send his own son. The word was going to be made flesh. This was going to be an investment, one that would cost him dearly. But he would do it anyway. Because the, 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 the opening up of this mercy of God is so precious and so, so um, effective in changing personalities. God went forward with the work. Even though it was going to cost him, in one sense, the, the greatest thing he had. 
the word would be made flesh and dwell among us, and it wouldn't go back afterwards to being what it was before. No, it would come, he would come back as a man. A man would enter into the courts of heaven. Why? Because this eternal purpose of God was so profound and it was so effective, God went forward with the work. And this is um, this is so, so some of the some of the the thoughts that motivated this this um these series of messages was that the, this this thing this project salvation was so effective that God went forward with it. He invested himself into it. This is an eternal project. This, the, the part that we see, it's just like the tip of the iceberg. We just see in this the beginning uh -huh. phases of, of what God's doing in salvation. He's just getting the people ready, all right, uh, to, to be there, perfect and entire, ready to do a work that's profound, more profound than we can consider at this moment. But see, it's something that God needed many sons for. It's something that God needed his mercy to be open and exposed, understood, so that now when he works, uh, well, this is going to be good. It's going to be good. See, you see what I'm saying? This is all preliminary work. Even the work of salvation that he's done here, it's all preliminary. We know that God hasn't saved us just so we can sit down and be saved. It's so we could do something. And, and all the, the parables that Jesus talked about and, and opened up were in order to something be done. See, you're, I give you, you've been faithful over a few things. You'll be a ruler over many things. You see, but do you see what this mercy's produced? It's, it's made an environment now where God's going to continue to open up stuff. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them to fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. So see, this, this is much bigger than, than, um, than what we've been given to see at this present time. This, we've seen enough to draw us in, to keep us, to nourish us, to change us, and then the ages to come. See, this is, it's going to continue on because it's everlasting mercy. Amen. Thank you, brother.